Welcome back, Perspectivists. We're here with an amazing person, someone who, if we listen to this story and we allow ourselves to open up and just be curious, I think our lives can change for the better, can become a little wiser. So today I have Melissa. Hi. Super happy to be here with you. Do you want to just, you know, tell us who you are and kind of what you're about in life? Sure. So thank one, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. But my name is Melissa. I go by Melissa May. And my title is Heaven's Haymaker. So I have a fighter name. So I am fighter by trade, not just what you would think in, in the ring boxing fighter, but military background and literally have been fighting what I feel like my entire life. Wow. Yeah. What are you fighting for? I'm fighting for people to understand their identity and their purpose, to understand the value of who they actually are and what they are created to be. Wow. I resonate with that so deeply because I think your identity is what makes or breaks you. Oh, for sure. When you think about, so, you know, we're here in one of three gyms yes. that you own and I'm looking around and I'm just thinking to myself, every day this gym is open, someone walks in here and they start over here, you know, at round one or wherever they start and they're working something out. This is a laboratory mm -hmm. for them where they're, there's more than just punching a bag that comes with this. Exactly. What is it for you when you do your workouts? What is it like, walk me through a little bit of what this is for you at a deeper level. Yeah, definitely. It's like you said, it's something you're working out. And that's been a big thing for me my entire life. Fitness literally was the catalyst, the gateway drug to help me become who I was created to be. I ran into some issues very young in life that forced me to go into the military, I wouldn't say forced, but it was my only way out to pay for college, to put a roof over my head, grew up in section eight housing, single, single mom. My mom was single with four of us. And I literally watched her work paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. And I told myself, I don't wanna live a life like that. I wanna be able to give more, not just to myself and my potential family in the future, but to give back to my mom. I wanted to provide a life for her. So I, I left that, I left at 18, joined right after high school into the military to be able to provide that future for myself, that uncertainty that was there as I was growing up. I didn't want that. I wanted something certain that I could build upon, a foundation I could build upon. Little did I know, very unbeknownst to me, I got married young, had a child young, and I entered into very abusive relationships because I didn't know who I was, because I lacked that identity. And because of those abusive relationships, whether it was emotional, physical, or mental abuse, forced me to get into fitness to help kind of build myself back up. And now most people would look at, like, if you were in that type of environment where you're being emotionally, physically, and mentally abused, you, you would hide away. It would, it would kill most people. But I needed a way out. My mom was always a fighter. Whether we were living from paycheck to paycheck on Section 8 housing and going from house to house, or whether I was seeing her be or those men hitting me, or even her abusing me, she never gave up. She never gave up. So I, I've, never, I've never understood not going, not continuing, not pushing forward. So fitness, it was like something I could give to myself. So every time I went to the gym, <laughs> and this, it's funny that I say it now because I, I'm a bodybuilder as well. And these relationships had me, had me questioning my worth because whether they were addicted to porn or cheating on me or hurting me emotionally or physically, it was just, I questioned my worth. So I'm like, I'm gonna go in the gym and build that worth. I'm gonna, no one's gonna question what I look like. I'm gonna have the perfect body. I'm gonna get on a stage and have these judges tell me as a bikini competitor that your body's perfect. How crazy does that sound? Strangers telling me my worth and that I, I'm good enough. And I did, I placed, I placed first, but then I was in tears still because I still lack that identity and lack that worth. So when I go to the gym now, it's to release those burdens, it's to release those bad habits, it's to release those limiting beliefs, it's to release those labels that were put on me from childhood on that had me questioning me, my, my self-worth and questioning me and everything I did and really devaluing myself and allowing myself to put me in these relationships that would, because I participated in them. I attracted these men into my life that could treat me that way because I didn't have respect or worth for myself. So yes, when I go to the gym, it's to release. When people come here to the gym, 
our mission is not just physically stronger in 30 minutes, it's mentally stronger in 30 minutes as well. It's helping you build that mental confidence because it's releasing something here. And the stories I hear, whether it's young you know, teenagers cutting themselves or women being abused at home or men going through some hurt, hang up or habit that's caused them to question their worth, they get to come here and work on that. It's just not a physical workout, but it's a mental workout. You know, <clears throat> Thank you. Receiving what you're saying, it's amazing to see you saying this because not only is it real to me, it's so real to you, but I had something happen in my story as I heard what you said. I believe that our living story allows the people around us to work out their living story. Exactly. And I always tell my story of losing my mom. People who've listened to this, they've heard this story before. I lost my mom at nine years old and when my mom, my mom got sick with COPD, mm. a chronic lung disorder, and I watched her go from my rock, my everything, my fighter, to, you know, over the period of three years to just wither away. Yeah. And the last moment I had with her was in the hospital. She was in a coma and I walked up and I took her hand and I said, mom, I love you. It's okay. I'm going to be okay. You can go to heaven. And she died that night. And what was powerful there is I was a fighter. But as I'm listening to your story, the reason my mom was in that hospital bed, the reason my dad passed later at 17, is because they didn't have this. Mm. And all I can think about is, is if my mom had had that, if she had a place where she could release and work that out, she could have kicked the life, the life choices she made that caused that to happen so young. Sure. And she could have been my fighter. And so when I'm hearing you say that, I'm thinking about every person who walks in here who is a mom or who is a dad or who will be or exactly. whatever they are. And I'm thinking about it's really real. It is changing their lives at a level that's just unbelievable. And to see you and how it's changed your life and to feel the energy that it's given you and the purpose it's given you, I just, I can't even express how thankful I am for you being here. And I appreciate you sharing that because when you when you say that, I do look at, so these are gyms, right? You called me an owner. I look at it more as a responsibility, the vehicle that's been given to me to give back to the world. Because like you, my mom passed away when she was just 48. Could have been prevented had she lived a healthier lifestyle. Now it was due to causes um, that the doctors interacted some drugs, but she had back surgery. Had she lived a healthier lifestyle, she wouldn't have been in there. But so every person that walks through that door, I, I find it, make it ethically responsible that I need to get their credit card information to change their life. Like this is an opportunity. They may come in here today and if I don't show them their purpose, their worth and why they're here, they might not be here tomorrow. I, I can recall just vividly, it was a couple of weeks ago at round four, sitting on the ground with a female. Um, it's an intense workout and she was tired, but she's like, I wasn't gonna come today. But if I didn't come today, I don't know if I'd be here today. It's, it's that little step, you know what I mean? It's like not, it's like everybody has a fighter in them, but somewhere along their journey in life, they stop fighting. They stop fighting. And there's a root cause. It's just not they just don't stop all of a sudden. There's something that's happened. I, I stopped fighting for myself. It's like, why do we stop fighting? Is because we forget who we are or we're not taught who we are, but we were all created to be somebody. I don't know if you, your faith background, but we were, we're children of God. The children, the child of a king with purpose. And it's our responsibility every day to pursue that purpose and to understand our identity. So my identity is... I'm so strong and confident in my identity now because of the trials I've gone through. It's almost like forced me to get there because I just felt so empty. And you'll feel people like the, the young lady at, at round four, she felt empty. She lost her identity. She didn't know who she was. She didn't know her purpose. So she didn't even know how to fight because she didn't know what to fight for anymore. So every day I get to give that opportunity to people, give them a reason to get back up and fight because everybody, including yourself, we are all fighters. We just forgot. It's crazy when you say that because someone we interviewed on this podcast about four months ago told us a sto their story 
we sat down with them and they told us a story of one of the most heinous things I've ever heard that happened to them. And they took their life a couple weeks ago. And when you, so when you said that, it's something I've been grasping with um, because we got their life story and we talked to them just like this. And this isn't about, this isn't about like j just talking or having conversations. It's about really connecting. And we felt that. We sat in the room with her and we felt her real story. And I mean, we got done and we walked away and we're like, Whew. and she had hope. But it was clear she didn't have her fighter. Mm -hmm. She was just kind of grasping. And now there's no chance to nurture that fighter. And when I think about round four, I'm like, wow, people don't understand how real that is. And because it's so real, there's a, people are struggling in America today so badly with feeling like they don't have a purpose. Mm -hmm. There is one right in front of you. There's somebody in your life right now. I mean, you don't have to own. I, were you able to help people before you owned a gym? <laughs> exactly. I like to say you're always perfectly positioned to help the person you once were. You're always perfectly positioned to help the person you once were. And if your identity is attached to, say, a gym or your profession or your spouse or your significant other or a hobby or a sport, what happens when, that, when that's gone? Like, my identity can't be rooted in these gyms. My identity can't be rooted in speaking, can't be rooted in my spouse. It's got to be rooted in that fighter because when all else is gone, that's all you have left. If I, these went away during COVID, what would be left of me? If my children are gone one day, then what am I? My identity is not a mother. My identity is not a gym owner. My, mili my identity is not a, vet a combat veteran. That's not my identity. My identity is I'm a child of the most high God. And that doesn't change. It's the same today, tomorrow, yesterday. It's never going to change. And I'm unconditionally loved. And I'm worthy. Like, that doesn't change. Everything else in the world can change. You can keep chasing that wind all day, that money, that fame, that success. You're going to get there, and you're going to still feel empty if you haven't found that fighter and that true identity. And that's what I was doing in relationships, chasing it in relationships, looking for validation and self-worth in relationships. And it didn't change. I just kept... It was like I was in prison. Literally, I was in prison for 10, 15 years in the wrong relationships, being abused because what I thought was home or home looked like, I was relating it back to what my home life looked like when I was a child, being abused, looking for validation from my mother. So when my mom passed away when she was 48, that changed my world. I was fighting every day for her. That's where my identity was rooted. Then she passed away, and I didn't get that opportunity anymore. Never, ever did I hear my mom tell me she was proud of me. Ever. And never, ever will I. But you know what? That doesn't matter. Because I know whose I am, and I know he's proud of me. And I don't have to do a darn thing. And that's the funny thing. What you're saying reminds me of something I heard from Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant said in one of his later interviews, he said that he was in a sixth grade basketball team league, and he was playing, and the whole season, he didn't score a single point. Mm. And he got to play, but he never scored a single point. This is Kobe Bryant. <laughs> the Kobe Bryant. Nothing. Yeah. And he came back, and he was talking with his dad. His dad said something like, whether you score a zero or a hundred, I'm going to love you the same. And Kobe said, and I'm paraphrasing this, but you should look this up on YouTube because it's amazing. He said, well, if he's going to love me no matter what, <laughs> I'm going to score a hundred. And he never had to sit there and worry about, does my dad love me? Mm -hmm. So he was never doing it for his dad. That was secure. I actually, I study this. My master's thesis, I'm in a PhD program in psychology and I study this. It's called Core Worth. That's the yes. full title. And people, I'm not supposed to share all this information, but you could find it online. <laughs> I'm going to share it because people need to know. Maybe. When people believe they have worth and value no matter what, that can't be stripped away from them mm -hmm. and that can't even be added to, you don't build that core worth. It's the same. It's the same. It's your life force, mm -hmm. and it stabilizes that whole identity so that you now get to choose what effect do I want to have on the world, not, who, not just who do I want to become so I feel good. It's like I know who I am. It's like what you're saying. I have clarity. I know who I am. I'm not worried about that. Exactly. I'm here to build people up. Exactly. And then you, you actually feel good. Exactly. So like when I was in those relationships, I wasn't in conscience congruency with who I knew I was created to be. And it was so much of unbecoming what I had become, those labels, habits, 
hurts, hangups, and habits to become what I was actually created to be. Because we were all created to be amazing and have purpose, but along the way, telling me I was only gonna be average in the first grade. Stuck with me all the way through high school, right? Being in abusive relationships or never being seen my mom stuck with me. So I had to unbecome, it's literally you have to unprogram yourself and reprogram yourself to understand your core worth. And then once you do that, because people, they walk around like, and, it, and that's probably the biggest thing that frustrates me the most is there are just wandering generalities out there with no aim and no purpose and there's no intention behind what they get to do. And my mom's passing taught me a few things. One, time is limited. Every day I was, one, not present because I was trying to prove to her that I was enough. So it didn't allow me to be present in the moment. So now every day I do my best to be present where I'm at by intentionally, consistently, persistently, without quit pursuing my potential. Every day we get that opportunity because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Nobody's guaranteed tomorrow, but all you hear is someday, one day, maybe, let's Netflix and chill, it doesn't matter. It's like, you don't get tomorrow. Like, what are you, really? It's like, you get right now. I get right now this moment with you. And hopefully we are extracting, I am very much so, thank you, extracting from you so much value and appreciation and love. We get today. We get today. So although my mom's passing, and I'm sure your mother's passing as well, was is something that hurts when I know where she's at, right? We know where they are and we get to go see them again today because we are rooted in our identity and we have that confidence. So death, this life we are living here right now, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And because we are living our purpose and our potential, we will see them again one day. Death does not scare me and it shouldn't scare you. You know what's crazy when you say that? I'm at a point in my life right now where spiritually, I don't talk a lot about my religious beliefs. Sure. But that is definitely something that saved me. It wasn't when I lost my mom and it wasn't when I lost my dad. It was when my girlfriend at 16. So we're in here, I'm gonna disclose something. This is gonna come back on me. So <laughs> when I'm finally famous and I'm running for something, you know, this will come back. But I was talking to you about how I ended up accidentally running like an underground fight club. Yes. And what was going on in my life was for a long time after my mom passed, I had intention. It was to make sure my friends never smoked cigarettes. That was a huge one. It didn't matter what we did, but as long as my friends didn't smoke cigarettes, they wouldn't die. And that's what it was, because I watched mom die, I knew smoking caused part of it, and I said, smoking kills. So now I was gonna be the kid who kept all the, the rough kids, which we were, from smoking cigarettes. Sure. And as we evolved, I kept doing that. I kept pursuing relationships. I dated this girl. It's so funny you say that. Because even in a relationship that's amazing, if your entire identity is about that relationship, mm -hmm. it really can't, it sets a liability. Exactly. I dated the same girl from fourth grade to seventh grade. Okay. I was in love with her. I mean, I literally, when I would see her, her parents got divorced. My mom died. I didn't know any of this about her when I saw her. When I first saw her walking to the bus stop, I think she had like a cute little blue windbreaker <laughs> on. And I saw her and I thought to myself, I was like, oh wow. Cause as soon as my mom died, it was all about like chasing girls. Like, cause I was trying to get anything that was close. Exactly. But I saw her and I lit up and it turns out she had a crush on me too. And we started dating, we write these notes to each other and we're kids and we're writing about like, one day we're gonna be married and we're gonna be swinging on a swing set, watching our children as the sun's going down and stuff. Like that, it was real. I remember those notes, reading wow. them. And I'm like, that is it but I started to lose my intention as I got older. And my friends started smoking and I couldn't stop them. And eventually I started to go down that path of maybe it doesn't matter. And I started just having people over. We got some boxing gloves. We were not <laughs> letting things up. <laughs> we were kids fighting in the barn, uh, thinking it was funny because we watched the UFC. <laughs> I like the UFC, but it, I mean, we just were right in the wrong position. It says, don't do this at home. We, we did it at home, it was, it was not good. <laughs> <laughs> but when we were there, I remember looking around me and I met this girl. So I'm looking at this, I thought it was kind of cool. And I met this girl and I remembered, it was, it was that anchor. Yeah. And I changed my whole life for her and mm -hmm. I did it again and I made my life amazing. And I got straight A's in school and I joined the basketball team and I disbanded the fight club. And I did, <laughs> the fight club. Like, <laughs> make sure you throw that out there. <laughs> yeah. And I did everything I was supposed to do 
to be a good person to make sure she had a great life and that we had a great life and that we empowered each other. And then she cheated on me with my best friend since first grade. Mm. And my world came crashing and I was despondent. I worked at Taco Bell and I was, they, I'd have to go back and they'd send me to dishes because everybody just empathized. I'd just be crying. I'm just like washing the dishes and I'm just bawling my eyes out. And it's funny to me now, but I was so broken. And I came, it was Jesus. I cried out to God one day and I felt like someone answered like whatever I said. And I just knew, I didn't know what it was, but I knew, I like, it was like I remembered who I was. I'm here to make sure that nobody ever goes through the pain I went through. Exactly. And it's so funny when you said that. Now, religiously, I'll be completely honest. I don't know whether heaven or hell exists. I'm not sure what I think about all that. But most importantly to me, I actually am so, so fused with the identity of service that whether I see my mom again or not, I actually don't even need to lean on that because I think about it, I feel like I'm with her every day. I feel like I'm with her right now. I feel like if my mom could see this, by the way, she would thank you. Oh, wow. I think she would say, like, my son needs amazing female role models in his life, and he's going to need that forever, and you're one of them right now in this moment, and I think she would thank you. And that's kind of where I'm at now, and I just don't know about those things. But I, what I resonate deeply with there is this idea of I have a certainty of what matters, and I'm not afraid of that anymore. And it makes me want to serve. It makes me feel like, it almost feels like heaven is here as long as I accept it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the truth of that spiritually, but I do know what it feels a lot better than feeling like everything just doesn't matter. You know, and I, when you say heaven is right here and you talk about service, I believe our purpose here on earth is connected to our skills, abilities, and talents. And once you learn and understand what those are, you then give them the way in the form of service. So you are living out your purpose with God coming through you. God's working through you. So I believe you are connected to your source and you get to perform miracles every day in the form of this information that you're providing and give people purpose and, and hope because you're telling stories for people where I can even imagine that you can look back in hindsight and connect the dots and see where God has shown up in your life. Many times, you maybe just sent him to voicemail, ignored the notification, but he was there by your side during the breakup, by your side with the passing of your mother. He was there and, and he's been there in my life in hindsight as well, but I also sent him to voicemail multiple times and ignored him. And it's probably, and I, I don't like to say I have any regrets, but kind of like Peter where he denied him or Simon denied him three times. That's probably my biggest, like had I, listen sooner, where would I be right now? Because you've all, we've all seen that success uh, picture where it says point A to point B, and it, it success looks like this with all the scribbles everywhere, right? It can look so much different. A to B could be so much quicker and so much smoother if we would just listen to God and focus on his purpose versus our agenda. When we start focusing on our agenda is usually where we get off track because we forget that we, the man with the plan, it has our back if we communicate and stay connected with source, right? But so often, like, we attach to ego and flesh, and we're like, I'm sorry, I just don't that. We attach to ego and flesh, and we think, we got it. I got this. But it's not about us getting this, because we're here to fulfill his purpose. It's not ours. It's his purpose through us. We're that vehicle. You know what I, what I really keep thinking about when you're saying this? I think there's so much truth to what you're saying. And I think about it a lot when you talk about ego and flesh because so many people, they get paralyzed when they feel like, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not confident enough. And then they also feel like people don't think I'm confident. People see me a certain way. They're worried about how people see them. And I, my kind of motto is if you're not confident, get committed. Mm. That's fine. You don't have to be confident when you step in here at round one. Nope. You get to that, bat you have no idea what the exercise is. You don't know what to do. How many people when they step up to the exercise machine or the, the different exercise they have to do, or they step up to a game they never played, they think about how they're not confident exactly. and they think about their ego and they're worried about how people see them. And the secret to all of this is get committed. 
I don't care if I look so silly. I don't care. You mean I don't punch like this? Like, come on. Exactly. Like, just say, I'm committed. I'm going to do this. I'm going to I'm gonna punch this bag, and I'm going to learn, and I'm going to be open, and I'm going to be patient. Because if someone else walks in here, and they're in the same spot, and I love what you said. You're in the perfect position to help the person, you know, who, who is where you just were. Exactly. So, so show up now so that that person who's right behind you if your job, if you, you were the person who couldn't step in the door and now you're at round one, be the person who steps in the door. Now, who do you have to be? How committed do you have to be for that next person to do it, you know? Exactly. And I love what you say about commitment because confidence comes from following through on the promises you made to yourself. And then you build the confidence by showing up. And as you, it's, I call it the competence, confidence loop. As you build that confidence, competence, it builds your confidence, you follow through on those promises you made yourself, you stay committed to self. And then before you know it, you have, like you said, you have to be willing to suck. You gotta be willing to make a fool of yourself. So when they ask me to do this charity boxing match I have coming up, I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry, you're asking me to get punched in the face on public, in, in public on nationally, right? I'm like, perfect, fantastic. But you have to be willing to be bad to be good. Right, and it's for a bigger cause than, than I can even imagine. So I will go do it. But I, I'm all about being uncomfortable. You got if you're comfortable, you're not growing. You got to embrace the discomfort to be able to grow. Adversity is necessary to introduce us to our highest self. I love what you're saying about adversity. Mm -hmm. And honestly, one thing that I've seen in today's culture, one thing I'd love to hear about from your perspective is what it means to be American, because part of this tour that we're doing, you know, we're spending a week in every single state and we're literally like we're visiting your local gym like we did not we have not met before this we've been no. online and yes. seen each other like a couple times and then here we are in your hometown where you actually live your life mm -hmm. and the more we've been getting around america we've noticed that people are really unclear about what america is it's like they it's so much of a like i have no idea that they they can think about their life mm. and they can think about their important groups when they think about their country, there is just like, oh my right? gosh. And, and there's like a feeling of division. There's a feeling of despair. There's a feeling of apathy. So many people are like, I don't, I don't even want to think about politics. And politics are supposed to be, you know, mindful, re like encouraging conversations about how we help society. And people are like, I don't even want to talk about it because it's too painful. So I'm curious, like your perspective, what, what do you think of when you think of like the American story? And coming from a military background, right? So combat military veteran in the Air Force. I was over in Iraq. And it, it guess it, like you mentioned, with your grandfather, I believe. And my grandfather was also a prisoner of war during World War II. So being over in Iraq and seeing what we have access to here versus what's going on over there where you're seeing people brought in on stretchers consistently where I, I received a certificate for surviving a hundred mortar attacks. I know what discomfort looks like. Transitioning to a civilian from the military was difficult for me because I don't have a lot of room for excuses or complaints because I've seen what it looks like on the other side. I think a lot of people have apathy and excuses and blame, shame, and justification because they don't know what they have. We are so blessed, so blessed here in America or even just as humans. Have they not traveled abroad or been to a third world country or been in war or been without or not understanding if they're even gonna get home to see their children again and see many people die? It's, it's unfortunate. And I'll just be 100% honest, it sucks. Like I have no room for those, for people in their excuses. It's just, it's sad. It's really sad. What you're saying, so we've been having an ongoing conversation on this tour about how we get that perspective. Mm -hmm. And while I've been here in Colorado Springs, I've now sat with you, I've sat with another, a Marine sniper, and I've looked into your eyes when you talk about this. And as I've been having conversations with people, I think people are so unequipped <laughs> to be able to even hear your stories. Mm -hmm. And that's something we talked about, a hundred mortar strikes. Now it's one thing to hear that. And people, if you're listening to this, I want to be very clear. I think our job as good, like good people is to be able to become the people who are resilient enough to hear the worst stories 
that our brothers and sisters have had to fight through. Exactly. You should never be afraid to tell someone your story. And that means we all have to be strong enough to hear them. And I'm looking into, you know, I'm looking <laughs> and I'm thinking, you're telling me about mortar strikes. If I actually sit there and think about that, I remember what it was like to hear a loud bang before, and I was scared. But then I could say, I'm in a nice, safe bed. Exactly. I'm okay. Right. That's that, but it's just like how losing parents. Mm -hmm. I feel such a level of gratitude and, and thankfulness for everything I do have. But if someone hasn't ever been in despair, it's like you just get to this thing where it's like, well, like the world's like kind of sucks. It's, it's not that bad. They're living, they, what would they need to go through to be able to appreciate right? this, you know? What is their rock bottom? Yeah. Because, and I, I've questioned that too, is because I believe my purpose is to help other people find their purpose, their identity. But what does it take for somebody? Because you just, you can't, you can't force it. They have to want it. And I had such a hard time telling my story before because I didn't think it was anything grand or important or special or they could change it. Yeah, I grew up on Section 8 housing. Yes, I watched my mom be raped. Yes, I've been divorced three times. Yes, I've been to Iraq and had been bombed multiple times and watched many people die and not see friends who return. But that was just my normal. Nothing special. I don't know anything else but to fight. I don't know plan B. I know just go. And yes, my identity and lack of purpose through the majority of my life and not knowing who I am caused me to make a lot of mistakes. And that's why it's such a passion of mine to help others understand who they are and that they have purpose and not hopefully they don't need to see that rock bottom, that they don't need to have mortar attacks or go through abusive relationships or watch parents pass away or friends pass away. Because I know you could look me, and I see the tears in your eyes. That hurts. And it's not, you know, healing is not a one-time event, it's a process. And where we've gone from maybe weeks and months in this pain and discomfort to minutes and moments, it's still there. It's still very much there. And probably what pushes me every day to still continuously get up, because I know what it looks like on the other side. You're like, you're talking about heaven. Life on this side of heaven, where you know who you are, you know where your confidence is rooted, and you get up every day, whether it's as an entrepreneur or just anybody, you know you're gonna get punched in the face. That's just life, especially as an entrepreneur. We signed up to get punched in the face every day. But once you understand that, I believe in a world where we take the tough hand we're dealt because it's gonna be given to us because they come in the form of lessons. That tough hand we're dealt is not a burden to carry, it's lessons to learn. And every lesson, every trial, every challenge, every tribulation that you go through, is only there to help reveal you, to help expose you to your next level, your highest self, to help you grow. People have just stopped growing. Because when adversity comes, what do they do? Well, the first thing, I think it's Tony Robbins who said this, is that people's biggest problem is they think that they don't, they shouldn't have problems. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, right? it's like almost, it's funny from perspectives like, I have no idea. I actually, it's crazy to say this, and I know, I, I wanna make sure I say this right. When I hear what you, you're you saying, like what you've gone through, when I was a kid, what I went through was so painful, but I also wished other people could go through it because I wanted to be understood. Mm -hmm. And so I, even as a kid, I decided, I was like, if I can go through something that someone's gone through, I, I want to. And so I would pray for it. I would get on my knees and I would pray. I would literally, I remember when I was, you know, trying to figure out, I had a friend in a small rural town of Ohio who was gay and was um, very con like confused about their gender. And so they were kind of transitioning and they were in seventh and eighth grade. And this was not normal. There was nothing on TV about this. There was no like conversations sure. about it. And I just remember my first response was, I went back to like my bed and I just prayed to be gay. Mm. And that sounds really crazy. And there's a sound bite. If you wanna, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, if, if someone sees the sound bite for that, and now you see my response to it, which is the full thing, pay attention. Please, continue to listen. Because the thing is, is I prayed for it. I was a kid and I prayed for it because I was like, I remember when 
I was the only person I knew without a mom, and I just wanted to be understood. And here was this person who was the only person who could go through this. And I'll tell you, I did not want to. That sounded terrible sure. to me. It was like, if, I, if this is something I can't control in this community where I grow up, this would ruin my life. But I was like, God, give me the experience. I was like, make me go through because I don't want them to go through it alone. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the most profound, like, like looking back on my life that I would pray for something like that. When I watch a movie and I see military action and I start to think about, I'll think of you and I'll think of the stories I hear and I'll think that real people have been through something like that that looks insane. And I even find myself wanting to look away and I'll say, no, you watch that. And it's not for punishment, it's for empathy. And every time I watch it, I build courage. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's necessary. You, you, I, thank you so much. You have seen things so that I don't have to. Mm -hmm. And that, there is no greater gift you could give to somebody. And if we can learn to, to, to see the gift that we've been given from service like you've done, I think it makes, at minimum, it makes it impossible to hate each other. It's beautiful. And that's a good starting point, I think. Oh, I agree. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's abnormal what you asked for, to be gay, to be able to understand. Because oftentimes when most people pray, they're asking for something, right? They're asking for healing. They're asking for wisdom. They're asking for strength. But here's the thing. God cares more about your character than he does your comfort. So this wisdom, this strength, this understanding of your friend in his particular position is going to come through the, some form of, test, trial, or tribulation to teach you to build that character. He never said it's going to be easy, but he did say he'll be with you. He did say he'll be with you. And I think that's why it's so powerful, one, to know he's on your side and he has your back, but two, to have coaches and mentors, people who've been in the position, one, that you want to be in or have gone through things. Like I have so many mentors and coaches that are sitting in seats I want to be in or have made an impact that I want to make that have paid the dummy tax, right? Mm -hmm. That have spent the time, with, uh, it allows me to time collapse because we're on a mission to change lives, right? We have light and love to share. We are here to change lives. And the faster, more efficiently we can do that, the better. We have a purpose here to fulfill. There's people doing that and that have done that. So attach yourself to mentors and coaches and people who are on a mission just like you are. I love that. I mean, what if we took, in the military, you go on a mission because there's a dire circumstance, mm -hmm. right? But there's other things you do. You do things to prevent war. You do things to prevent it ever getting there. Yes. And I think of coaching and I think of powering people up and, and actually getting them to purpose. If people are not living purposefully, that right there, if, that, if we have a whole society of people who are not connected to purpose, here comes. I mean, the, the pain comes and it gets worse and they become resentful. And then they, exactly. we got to do that. I love how we're doing that. I want, to, I want to bring it back to something here. When I'm thinking about what you're saying, when I'm thinking about your story, you've done some amazing things. Like you're in the process now of actually, I mean, it's crazy what you were telling me. You're getting to interview people who are at the highest level of this game. And, and when I say game, I mean it like at the highest level of purpose. It's not just a game, it's purpose. They're at the highest level and you're getting mm -hmm. to do that and I hope to do that someday, but I'm happy where I am now. I'm happy in the process. I'm like, I just want to be on the path. Yes. So I guess I'd ask you, as you're going through this, in this season of your life, as a fighter, are there any fears that pop up that come into your way? And at this season, what would be that fear? And how do you respond if, those, if that fear starts coming up? It's a beautiful question. I like to say I don't live in fear at all because there's no fear when you're connected to source because God is love. So if I find myself in a state of fear, I have to quickly check myself and what am I really fearing if I know whose I am, right? But it, my biggest motivation every day is to know that one day I'm going to look at my Lord and Savior in the eyes and he's going to introduce me to the woman I could have been. And I want to be able to recognize her. I want to be able to recognize her. So every day, intentionally, I get up with purpose. And whether that's taking out the trash or seeing someone at, someone at the market, I consistently, persistently, every day pursue my potential. And that starts with being present.
present in the moment. You have to be present. You have to be intentional. You have to show up. It's like you're saying, Melissa, you get to interview these amazing people, but the joy is found in the journey because I may never get to Nashville. I may never get to St. Louis. I may never get there. That's a week, next week, the week after, but I get today and I can show up today and I may never interview those people or I may never get that next, what I believe is that big opportunity or what we think success actually looks like. But you have that opportunity with me today, and I have that, this opportunity with you today, and this is enough. That, my favorite thing about what you just said, I've heard those words before, that you get to heaven and you'd be introduced to that, but I've never been able to feel those words until this moment. I bet I've heard those words, you know, several times come out from things or whatever, but I never actually feeling the sincerity of that. And I actually envisioned that. I envisioned you as you are right now and you stood in front of this person and it was the same person. And I just thought about how amazing it would be to recognize it. But then I thought about what would happen if it was a different person. And inside I was destroyed. I was like, cause you can't go back to this part. No, you can't. You can't like in, and maybe having children or like you said, having someone pass. You don't get that time back. Time, you can always make more money. You can't get time back. You get right now. Right now. I don't get that time back to see my daughter's first steps when I was in Iraq. You don't get that time back. I was not present with my mom because I was striving for something. I was chasing something that I never got. So I missed out. And I want to say that's regret, but it was a big lesson learned. Huge lesson learned, and now I can take that and apply it and make today better. Wow. Do you, do you have children now? I do. I have three children. Three children? Mm-hmm. Thinking about those children, one of the things, the, the way I like to wrap these up is to talk about um, a core value. And I know, I know for you, one of them is always going to be to have that relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And what I love about that, that I do know that about you, is that hearing you say that, I understand what that means that's really powerful. When you think about your kids, if you had to give them a lesson for life, you had to say, okay, listen, this is a value that it's really important for you to have and I want you to have it. What would you give them? That you are unconditionally loved and you have someone that loves you more than I could ever love. Wow. Yeah. I don't believe our children are for us. They come through us. They come through us. And just like these gyms have been placed in my responsibility, so have my children. So has this opportunity. And it is my responsibility because he's given me this opportunity, children, Jim, you, to make the most of this moment and to share his light and love in this exact moment here. I, I feel his light and love. Um, my first career was going to be to become a pastor before I went down the road of psychology. Wow. And maybe that will be someday, I have no idea. But I always say, thought to myself, if someone came up to me, because people would go up and thank the pastor. And I always thought to myself, anytime I ever speak in front of the church or I try to do work, my thought was the best thing anyone could ever say to me is I felt God through you. <laughs> Because I genuinely knew, I was like, this is not, this is not something I choose to, for people to like me or for people to think I'm good or people to think I'm cool. It was like, or to, to, to fit in. It was like, there was nothing about that. It was all about, it was genuinely being a living testimony. And I think that applies no matter what like spiritual beliefs you have right now. Your life is your testimony. You mm -hmm. need to share it and you need to share it in truth. Exactly. Because your story can change a life. It can. And I want to. You are a pastor. You are pastoring right now. Your audience is your congregation. You are doing that. And I think the big disconnect between a church and their congregation is, yes, we accept that title. We get baptized. We become Christians. But we forget that part's not taught is that you have purpose. That once you accept that title, now go share the light and the love. And that's what you're doing. That is what you're doing. You're helping people find purpose. Right. You're pastoring. Wow. Thank you so much. My pleasure.